So today we're going to talk about thyroid problems. We're going to talk about some weight loss and how they're interrelated with each other. Everybody can hear me okay? Good. Okay. And if I'm in your way, just let me know. So my name is Dr. Podlaski. Um, I practice right here in the villages. Um, licensed to practice chiropractic medicine, but I also have a naturopathic medicine degree. They don't license naturopaths in Florida anymore. That was back in 1959. Uh, and I also have an MD degree. I have about four board certifications in clinical nutrition. So my practice really focuses on nutrition, functional medicine, um, things like that. So we're more of a natural medicine, internal medicine practice is, is what I do. I don't write prescriptions for drugs. I don't do any of that kind of stuff by choice. So that's all the different things that I, that I do. And that's where we're at. We're in the uh, Santa Fe Professional Building right on 466, right here in the villages. And we've been there, oh, we're going on our fourth year now. Before that, I was in another building over in the Lang Eye Institute building. So a little disclaimer to keep our friends at the FDA happy and my son, who's an attorney, keep him happy. I'm only here to give information. I'm not here to tell you to stop taking any drugs or medications that your doctor has prescribed. This is for informational purposes only. So everybody okay with that? All right, good, we can go on. Of course, like everybody else, we have a Facebook page. I put information on it on natural medicine, nutrition, at least two or three times a week. So you can check that out. Um, wrote a book called Unleashing the Physician Within. One of the quotes from the book that I like is called, if you treat your health today, you won't have to treat your disease tomorrow. So that was written by myself and a friend of mine. So today we're gonna to talk about thyroid problems and how they happen to people. We're gonna also talk about the truth behind some of the lies you've been told about thyroid and autoimmune problems as well. There's a lot of different reasons why people develop thyroid problems. We'll talk about that. What you can do to protect yourself from drug side effects. Another issue that's not talked about, we're also gonna talk about the lies you've been told about weight loss or why you're still gaining weight. And it's really tied into thyroid a lot of times as well. So we'll talk about all those things. So for a lot of people, I see a lot of patients that have thyroid problems and most of them have told me that they've been on thyroid medication for 30, 40 years or longer and yet they still have a lot of their same issues with their thyroid, whether it's their they can't lose weight or their hair is falling out or they have dry skin or they can't tolerate the cold gets below 70 here in the villages and everybody puts a blanket on or something so that's kind of typical of thyroid so people still gain weight depression fatigue exhausted all these are all things sir uh, do, do, if you have a thyroid problem does it show up on your blood test when you have them we'll talk about that absolutely now the problem is that most doctors only check a couple of the blood tests for thyroid. They'll do TSH, they'll do T3 if you're lucky, maybe even T4, but there's eight or nine thyroid tests that really should be done to see what's going on. And we're gonna talk about that in, in the presentation. Yes? Can you please tell me where my thyroid is located? I'm gonna tell you about that in a second. It's coming up here, okay? I covered that. All right, so a lot of people, like I said, are frustrated. They have cravings for things, and that's related also to why they gain weight, but it's also related to adrenal gland problems, which I guarantee you, if you've been to your thyroid specialist or an endocrinologist and have a thyroid problem, they probably never talk to you about your adrenal glands. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight as well. So most people either wanna to try to get off their medications, reduce their medication, they wanna lose weight, they wanna have more energy, they want to feel better. And a lot of people want to know, well, what should I eat? You know, because a lot of their doctors will say, well, you need to eat healthier, but they never tell them what that means because they probably don't know themselves what that means. So we talk about that with our patients as well. So a lot of people are confused about what to do and you're not alone with that whole thing. The approach that we take in our office is what we call a functional medicine approach. Anybody familiar with that term, functional medicine, functional nutrition? So we're really looking to get to the root cause of your problem, not just your symptoms. The symptoms are really the tip of the iceberg, but the big part of the problem is underneath the surface. It could be lifestyle, what you eat, drink, smoke or don't smoke, what you put on your skin, what you're exposed to, environmental genetics, things like that. So all those things go to make what's happening with your symptoms. Unfortunately, most of the time when you go to traditional medicine, uh, and I'm a medical doctor too, but I don't, again, I don't practice drug medicine, they're mainly focused on your symptoms and let's try to get rid of your symptoms as best we can. 
and they a lot of times don't have time to deep, deep dig into what's going on behind the surface and why you're having some of the problems. So a lot of times doctors will do some lab work on you and normally they'll say, well, if it's in between the high and the low, don't worry about it, you're okay. But the problem with that is the highs and lows are based on sick people. So if it's too high or too low on the lab test, usually it means by that point things are breaking down, damage is being done, tissues are being damaged. Now, the other way we look at blood work in my office is what we call on the functional range. It's inside the lab range and it tells us more about how your body's functioning and working. It's not too high or too low, it's right where it should be. And that's based on healthy people where the other lab range is based on sick people. And that's why things keep getting worse and worse as far as blood tests go. So a lot of people come in feeling like this to my office um, because they've been to their doctors, they're a little frustrated with what's going on, and basically we call them, they're kind of the walking wounded in the healthcare gray zone. You're listening to what your doctor says, you're taking your medication or doing what your doctor says you should do, and yet you don't quite feel right and you know there's something else that could be help with you. So people end up very frustrated with the whole situation, especially a lot of times when you're either your insurance or Medicare or whatever limits the test you can have done or they limit the treatments that you can have done. It gets a little frustrating for people. So you're not alone. We see people from all around, actually all around the country, and even people from out of the country who hear about the work we're doing in functional medicine and uh, functional nutrition. So my job basically is what I call myself a healthcare, a holistic healthcare detective. We try to get to the root cause of your problems so that we can put together a personalized clinical roadmap back to health based on each person. I may have 20 patients with thyroid problems, and I guarantee you I probably treat each of them a little differently based on what we find from their exam, from their blood work, from their symptoms, and things like that. So I do have one commercial tonight. If you like what I have to say and you're interested in finding out more about what we do from a natural medicine perspective, we do offer what we call a, a pre-patient interview. It's basically, it's a complimentary interview. You can come into my office. You can sit and talk to me for a few minutes. I'll ask you questions like, what's been going on? How long have you had the problem? What have you done about it? And what would you like to do about it? And it's a way for you to interview me to see if I'm, a, if you, I'm what you're looking for as far as a doctor. And that's, it's low stress. There's no, there's no high sales pitch with that. It's just an opportunity for you to come in for a few minutes just to sit and talk to me about what's been happening with you. So my main concern is what's been going on with your health and how I can best help you. That's the approach that we take. So here's an answer to your question. Where is the thyroid, okay? So the thing you have to understand is that your thyroid has an impact on the whole body because every single cell in your body has receptors for thyroid hormone and every single part of your body has an impact on your thyroid gland as well. So here's where your thyroid is. Your thyroid is located at the base of your neck. It's a little butterfly shaped uh, gland and it produces hormones so it's right behind your Adam's apple and it's kind of shaped like a bow tie. Your thyroid gland produces thyroid hormones and we'll talk about those real quickly in a second here too. Mainly it produces hormones T4 which is the inactive form of thyroid hormone and T3 is the active form. Over your lifetime, and this is kind of hard to believe, but your thyroid gland only produces about a teaspoon worth of thyroid hormone. So it can tell you how powerful thyroid hormone is, and it can make you feel wonderful, and it can make you feel terrible if things are not working properly with the thyroid. So the T4 and the T3 really indicate the number of iodine atoms. You've all heard that iodine is important for thyroid function, right? Well, T4 means there's four atoms of iodine, and T3 means there's three. That's really what that means. So, like I said before, every single cell in the body has receptors for thyroid hormone. So it kind of tells you how important that thyroid is. And people with low thyroid often have a variety of symptoms. Depression, weight gain, brain fog. Anybody have brain fog? Know what that is? Okay, you're one person? COVID. COVID, oh yeah, that's a big one too. I just did a lecture out in Phoenix two weeks ago for a bunch of internal medicine doctors on long haul COVID symptoms. I have a long haul. Okay, well we see that in our office too. So other common symptoms, again, fatigue, weight gain, inability to lose weight, weight loss resistance, which really oftentimes is a thyroid issue, loss of the outer third of the eyebrows, hair falling out, dry skin. There's a lot of different symptoms that go along with thyroid problems, and you can see a whole bunch of them. Now, the majority of people who have hypo or low thyroid, sorry ladies, it's you guys, okay? 
Now, there's reasons for that, and we're not going to go into great detail tonight, but some of it is hormonal, some of it is genetic. And the same thing with long-haul COVID, which is kind of off topic. The great majority of people who have long-haul COVID where it doesn't go away are women. Okay, but again, it's genetics and hormone issues. So many people only think of their thyroid when they have symptoms. It's kind of like the dashboard light of your car. You drive down the road, and all of a sudden the check engine light comes on or the oil light comes on. Well, most people know if something like that happens, if the oil light comes on, it usually means you better do something about it and at least get it checked out because you can destroy the engine if you don't. So if you have some problems like that, like the warning lights on your car, when you have thyroid symptoms, there's a number of things you can do. So going back to our car example, if you pulled into a repair station or a gas station or whatever, and you had the mechanic check out your uh, engine light, that why is, why is the oil light on? The mechanic says to you, well, I know how to fix that. Let's just go into the dashboard and let's cut the wires off that goes to the light. Would that really fix your problem? No. Would you go back to that mechanic if that's what they did for you? Well, the symptom went away, right? The light's the symptom, but the problem didn't go away. And that's essentially what happens to a lot of people when they're taking thyroid medications. It covers up your symptoms, but it doesn't fix your problem long term. So. A lot of it is because many times the doctors only rely on thyroid stimulating hormone. TSH is really not even a thyroid hormone, it's a pituitary gland hormone. Your pituitary gland is a gland in your brain that measures all your hormone levels throughout your life. If your pituitary senses that your thyroid, your thyroid hormone is low, it'll produce more thyroid stimulating hormone. That's why the TSH goes up when you have lower hypothyroid. So it tells the thyroid gland, you need to put more thyroid hormone out. So the TSH, basically, it's, it's a marker, but it's not the most important one, but it's the one most doctors re, re, uh, rely on for the most part. And fixing the TSH number is like cutting the wires onto the dashboard with the medication. It doesn't fix the problem. It's only a symptom of what's really going on. And most people, level thyroxine, which is synthetic T4, about 70% of people who take T4 still have thyroid problems. It doesn't fix all their problems. They still come in complaining, again, about dry skin, hair falling out, all that stuff. And they say to me, Doc, I've been on this thyroid hormone for years and years and years. Why am I still having problems? And there's a reason for that we'll talk about in a second here, because it's not fixing your problems for you. So. 70% of people taking thyroid hormone replacement, you're basically just cutting the wires onto the dashboard. It's not fixing it for you. So the other thing you can do is nothing. So a lot of people will say, well, maybe it'll just go away. And that actually leads to further and further problems down the road for you. Now, there's also a big thing that happens that in 90% of people who have hypo or low thyroid, 90% of the time, your problem is actually Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune thyroid problem. Most of the time, your doctor doesn't check for it. Why? Because Medicare doesn't want to pay for it. And, this, and it's, only, it's very inexpensive. It's like $25 to do the test to see if you have Hashimoto's. And the other reason they don't do anything about it is because they don't know what to do about it. They won't treat you any differently whether you have Hashimoto's or you don't. So they're still going to prescribe Synthroid or Levothyroxine or Cytomel or one of those things. They're not going to treat you differently. And if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, again, 90% of people with hypo or low thyroid, it's actually Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune problem. You have to treat that differently than if it's just run-of-the-mill hypo or low thyroid. So the other thing is that um, statin drugs are also, a lot of people are on statin medications which can have a very negative effect, you know, the cholesterol lowering drugs. And there's some recent studies that came out that show that statins are linked to causing thyroid cancer in women. Now, I bet your doctor doesn't tell you that when they put you on Lipitor or Crestor or Zocor or any of those medications. Again, all they're trying to do is get your cholesterol number down and get your TSH down. Basically, cut the wires again. But there's a lot of sh studies that show that statins are immunosuppressive, meaning it suppresses your immune system, and that's really what cancer is. Sharon it's a Connor, 
It's a failure of the immune system to, um, su to protect the body. Okay, so the best choice is to have things checked out completely. Unlike the mechanic who just wants to cut your wires, you need to check a bunch of different things. So this is why testing TSH is not enough. Because again, the hypothalamus in the brain tells the pituitary what to do, and the pituitary through TSH tells your thyroid gland what to do. Now, when your thyroid gland produces more thyroid hormone, about 93% of it comes out as T4, which is the inactive form. That needs to be converted over to T3, which is the active form. And that works great in your body if a lot of things work properly. For example, 60% of the conversion of T4, the inactive form, to T3 takes place if your liver is functioning right. Well, a lot of people we find now, it's kind of epidemic, have what we call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So your liver is congested with fat, and now you're not making the conversion from T4 to T3 properly. The other reason can happen is that your intestines have to be functioning properly. About 20% of the conversion takes place if your intestines are working right. Well, we find a lot of people have what we call leaky gut and dysbiosis. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And then the other thing that's important is to have your adrenal glands functioning properly. And that's what I mentioned before, that oftentimes your endocrinologist, your thyroid specialist, doesn't even check your adrenals to see if they're functioning properly. So those could be all big problems. So there's a number of things that uh, interfere with converting T4 to T3, the active thyroid hormone. We're not going to go through every one, but you can kind of glance at it there. Stress, eating soy, heavy metals, diabetes, alcohol, to excess things like that inhibit it. So the other big problem is if you've been taking any of these T4 medications for a long period of time, like Synthroid or Levothyroxine, eventually they inhibit your body's ability to convert T4 to T3. When your doctor's giving you these medications, they're assuming that your body will convert the T4, which is the majority of these medications, into T3. But these medications actually work against your body doing that if you take it for a period of you know four or five years or longer. Now your body's not converting it properly. That's why for a lot of people, they have to keep increasing their medication dosage because it's not working anymore. So these are the tests that I run on patients to see if your thyroid is uh, functioning properly. So of course we do TSH, but we do total T4, we do total T3, free T4, free T3. We do T3 uptake, we do thyroid binding globulin, which is the taxi cab to move the thyroid hormone around the body. We also check for reverse T3. Now reverse T3 is inactive T3. We talked about how T3 is the active form, but a lot of people we find have an elevated reverse T3, which means it's not working in their body. So the doctor, if they don't check for reverse T3, they may get fooled that it may look like your T3 is good on the blood test, but it's actually not because it's reverse T3. The blood test, the normal blood test, doesn't distinguish that unless you check for reverse T3, which is what we do. And then the other test that we do for your thyroid, number nine, is TPO antibodies and thyroid binding or thyroglobulin antibodies. Those are the two tests that tell us if you've got Hashimoto's or not. And that becomes critically important. Hey, Missy. Um, and then there's two other tests that could be done if we suspect somebody has Graves' disease, which is actually the opposite. That's where you have hyperthyroid function. Your thyroid is working too much, and you may have a rapid heart rate. You may develop AFib. You may have other issues like that, or you, you can't stop losing weight. It's one of the symptoms that people have with Graves' disease. Graves' disease is a much more serious condition than Hashimoto's. They're both autoimmune problems, but with Graves' disease, we have a very narrow window to get that under control because then it starts affecting other things like your heart and cardiovascular system. Hashimoto's, we have a longer time we can actually figure out what's wrong and get it under control for you. So when we do these tests, it can tell us a number of things. It can tell us if your thyroid problem is what we call primary hypothyroidism. In other words, the thyroid's not working like it's supposed to, not making enough thyroid hormone. Or we can tell if there's a problem with the pituitary gland or your hypothalamus, which is supposedly directing the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone. But we also can tell through the test that I do whether you have Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. Those are game changers for people. And then the last one is it also can tell us 
if your thyroid problem <clears throat> is actually caused by your adrenal glands not functioning properly, and we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes here. So for anybody to develop an autoimmune problem, there's three things that are necessary to take place. The first is a genetic predisposition. In other words, somebody in your family tree, mom, dad, grandparents, whoever, handed down genes to you that make you more susceptible to an autoimmune problem. And really, the, at the bottom line, an autoimmune problem, essentially what it means is that your immune system is now not recognizing your own body tissues and is trying to kill it off. It's Do trying to attack your own body. Okay. That must be another, uh, another talk, I guess. The next thing that's necessary is what we call an environmental trigger. And that typically can be foods, uh, chemicals, toxins, heavy metals, particularly in thyroid problems which lead to weight gain, it's gluten. Now you've probably heard of gluten-free stuff and some people still think it's a fad and it's not going away. Believe me, it's not a fad, it's a real problem. And I do a whole talk, we do a talk once a month at the Belvedere branch of the library on a variety of different topics. And if you go to my website, you can see when the topics, are, what talks are coming up over the next, over the next year. So gluten's a big one. Cross-reactive to gluten is something that probably people drink every day of their lives, a lot of people. And cross-reactive means it, act, it acts the same way as gluten, and that's coffee. People don't realize that coffee can cause thyroid problems as well as weight issues as well. And then the last thing is leaky gut and dysbiosis, which we'll talk about real quick here. So those three things, genetic predisposition, a trigger, and leaky gut can cause you to have an autoimmune problem, including Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Graves' disease. So what we're saying is there's a big connection between how your thyroid functions and what's happening in your intestines. In fact, 90% of people's health problems start right in their gut, right in their, actually it starts with what you're putting in your mouth every day, but it's really taking place in, in your gut, your intestines that are doing that, including that. So gluten is a factor that affects, gluten loves obesity, thyroid issues. They're all confused metabolism, including diabetes all love gluten. Yeah. And so what's gluten? Well, gluten basically is a protein made up of gluten, gl like gliadins and glutenins. And it's the stuff that makes everything like bread, pretzels, crackers, cookies, cake, the stuff that everybody loves. It makes it kind of chewy and mm -hmm. more protein in there. And it's still recognized beneficial by the American Diabetes Association, the Heart Association, the USDA, and mom and grandma everywhere. It's all the comfort food stuff that people eat, but it's really not very healthy for people for the most part. Now, not everybody has celiac, you've all probably heard of celiac disease, right? That's about one to 3% of the population. That's an autoimmune problem. It's caused by eating gluten. 30 to 40% of the population have what we call non-celiac gluten sensitivity. They get a lot of the same symptoms as somebody that has celiac disease including intestinal problems. But you know what the number one symptom of, of gluten sensitivity is? Brain fog. Brain fog is the you know, memory focus concentration issues from eating gluten. So about 30 to 40% of the population have that. The New England Journal of Medicine lists 55 diseases that are caused by eating gluten. So your daily bread may not be such a good thing for people, especially if you have other issues going on. So, Normally in your intestines, we have a situation called eubiosis. And what that means is that in our intestines, we have about 100 trillion bacteria that live there, give or take, depending on your weight and your size. 80% of those bacteria should be the good probiotic bacteria. They make hormones, enzymes, vitamins. They assist your metabolism, your digestion. In fact, the good healthy ones tell your brain to eat good healthy food. However, when there's an imbalance between the good and bad bacteria, it can cause problems with your thyroid gland because now you're not converting T4 to T3 and the bad guys kind of take over. When that happens, it's called dysbiosis. That 80-20 ratio, 80, 80 good to 20 bad, kind of flips around the other way and now you've got more of the bad guys that tell your brain you need to eat sugar and junk food and carbs and all the bad stuff that makes you gain weight and gives you diabetes and makes you lethargic so dysbiosis basically means it's an imbalance between the good and bad bacteria, and that can lead to leaky gut. And leaky gut basically means what it sounds like. 
Normally, the cells that line your intestine are very tight and close together, so nothing leaks into your bloodstream that shouldn't be there, like viruses, bacteria, parasites, undigested proteins. But when you have leaky gut, those cells start to separate, and they're called tight junctions. It's really a protein. And now those things start to leak into your bloodstream, which can cause problems like inflammation. And it may be a trigger for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, that inflammation inhibits your ability to lose weight or it makes you gain weight. Okay? A lot of those things happen when you have leaky gut. Now, part of it has to do with the fact that in the farming practice in the United States, they spray Roundup on a lot of these crops, all the grain crops. And the Roundup causes lots of problems because that residue is in the food that you're eating. And when that happens, it makes your intestines, the good bacteria in your stomach, in your intestines sick. So they don't do their job anymore. And they're being, they're being poisoned by Roundup. All right, so it's kind of frightening to see that happen as well. So one way we can tell in our office if you have leaky gut is we do a urine test. It's called a urinary indicant test, simple urine test. And it tells us whether your urine is uh, normal, clear, low positive, medium, high, or very high positive. It's a screening test to see if you've got dysbiosis and leaky gut, which may be contributing to your thyroid problem as well as to your weight problem. Because if you have leaky gut, you're not gonna lose weight. You're not gonna lose weight, you're gonna be inflamed. And so one of the other tests that we can do if you show up positive on our indicant test is we do a stool sample test called a GI MAP test. That can tell us specifically if you've got bugs, worms, parasites, protozoa, viruses that are contributing to your leaky gut and what we need to do to fix it. So this stool sample test, basically what they're checking for is that the bugs that live in your intestine don't live in your poop, they don't live in the, the stool, they live in the lining of your intestines, which is you have a mucus layer in your intestines that kind of protects your body. When you have leaky gut and dysbiosis, that mucus layer starts to break down and those bugs are there, but they will shed their DNA into your stool. That's what we're testing for with this lab. If the DNA is there, you've got the bugs, whether it's worms, parasites, viruses, bacteria, the bad ones or whatever. So it's a real important test that we do on some patients, depending on what we find from our other tests and from the urinary indicant test. So the other reason that this is important is because the bugs that live in your intestines, we call them your second brain. Because what happens here directly affects what happens up in your brain. They communicate to your, with your brain through, um, through um, vitamins, but also through something called the vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve that goes from your brain throughout all of your organs. In your, in your gut. So if they're not happy, your brain's not gonna be happy as either. So these beneficial bacteria, although it may indicate if your doctor doesn't test far enough, it may say, he may just say, or he, she may say, you just have low thyroid, but there can be a whole bunch of other reasons why your thyroid may not be functioning properly and it can affect your intestines. And things like lack of sleep, not eating healthy fruits and vegetables, uh, the wrong bacteria in there. So those are things that we check about. Now, a lot of people take probiotics, but I have to say this, a lot of the probiotic companies are lying to you. They'll tell you there may be 50 billion CFUs, colony forming units, but that's at the moment they're manufactured. Then they get manufactured, they get transported, they get stored on the shelf, and by the time you take it and swallow the pill, and then your stomach acid destroys most of it, you're getting very, very little benefit out of these probiotic bacteria. I'm sorry, but you can't get any benefit from eating yogurt. There's, first of all, most yogurt is loaded with sugar, which increases your leaky gut and dysbiosis. And then by the time you swallow it, your stomach acid is killing off the rest of it. So in fact, Activia was sued by the FDA because they made all these crazy claims that turned out not to be true. So, we use a particular type of probiotic in our office. One of them is a spore form, which means that when you swallow the capsule, it bypasses your stomach and gets released in the large intestine where you want it to be. Uh, it becomes active there. Some of them are enteric coated, which is good. Um, but most of these probiotics don't do the job that they're supposed to do. They just don't really work. So these are all the things that may be affecting your thyroid while your thyroid is not functioning properly. Stress. That yo-yo dieting, you know, the up and down, up and down, yo-yo, you've heard of yo-yo dieting, right? That's a stressor on the body. How many of you with thyroid problems use fluoride in your toothpaste, fluoride toothpaste? 
that interferes with thyroid function. Not a good thing to do. There's a lot of companies out there that have non-fluoride toothpaste that work just as well. And then certainly eating gluten and certain medications will interfere with your thyroid function as well. Medications for other things that you're taking, including blood pressure and things like that, uh, even Parkinson's medication sometimes. So a lot of these thyroid problems lead to what we call obesity problems. Weight, how many would you think we have an, a weight problem in this country? We do, we do, pretty much, okay? So I like this quote, a Chinese proverb, if you wanna know your past, look into your present conditions. If you wanna know your future, look into your present actions. What you do today determines what happens to you, obviously, down the road. So here's a little statistics on this. Over 175 million Americans are considered overweight. 80 million Americans are considered to be obese. And what does that mean? Well, obesity, you have a BMI, body mass index of 30 or higher, and you're 30 or more pounds over what your ideal weight should be. So that's what's considered uh, obese in the United States still. Now, part of this whole thing started, it's really an epidemic, obesity. It started back in the 1970s. If you all remember when the government came out and they told everybody to stop eating fat. Remember that? Don't eat fat, it'll make you fat, it'll give you heart disease. Nonsense. I've never told patients that. You need healthy fat in your diet, including some animal fat, because your brain functions better on some saturated fat. Or good vegetable fats like avocados and olive oil and coconut oil, things like that. So look at that chart. Right around 1976, 1980, that's when the government told everybody to stop eating fat. And what did people do? They stopped eating fat. And what did they eat instead? Sugar, carbohydrates, eat more of those kind of things. So this is the obesity chart, but look how it corresponds also with um, the low fat guidelines right there. It kind of goes up the same way. We can also say the same thing, I didn't put these charts in here, but that's when the diabetes epidemic really took off. That's when the Alzheimer's and dementia epidemic also took off. You need healthy fat for your brain to function properly. Everybody who's on these cholesterol lowering drugs and all that, I and a number of other doctors believe that statins are one of the main reasons why we have an epidemic of dementia and Alzheimer's now, because it's lowering the healthy fat in your brain. So there's a neurosurgeon or a cardiac surgeon out in Arizona that basically what he says, if you eat a low fat or no fat diet, that's like taking a brush and rubbing it over your skin four or five hours a day, and what's gonna happen to your skin? It's gonna get red, raw, and bleed. That's what happens to the inside of your arteries if you don't eat healthy fat in your diet. So it's actually destroying your arteries. It's causing leakage and, and damage in there. And the best substance in the world to seal up those leaks is what? <laughs> cholesterol. Now, the doctors blame cholesterol for the problem, but it's that low fat, high carb, high sugar diet that's causing a lot of these problems for people. So we know after four or more decades of eating low fat, Diabetes is rampant. It's up 70% in the last 50 years. It's doubled in the last 10 years. How many of you know a diabetic? How many of you know somebody or live with a diabetic? Pretty much when I, it doesn't matter if the room is a small room like this or there's a thousand people in the room when I give a talk, pretty much every hand in the room goes up because diabetes is so prevalent. So we know obesity, again related to thyroid, causes three of the five top causes of death in the United States. The first one is heart disease. Second is cancer. The fourth one we call diabetes, diabetes, which is diabetes and obesity are very closely related. What's the third leading cause of death in the United States? Anybody want to take a guess? Properly prescribed medication from your doctor. And that's from the Journal of the American Medical Association. We're talking about supposedly properly prescribed medication. It doesn't include over-the-counter Tylenol or ibuprofen, which people actually have heart attacks and strokes from taking that stuff, or it affects your liver as well. So properly prescribed medication. So we know obesity is going up. Um, it's not going down. In 2019, the last time they had some study, it rose in 23 states and didn't go down in any states. And at the current rate, the government's statistics show that by um, 2059, all Americans will be overweight if we don't do something to change it now. So these are some of the medical hazards of obesity. Again, it, they say now it outweighs smoking as a life threat. It increases your risk of cancer. For every 10 pounds extra up front, it causes 30 more pounds 
pressure on your low back. So how many have low back problems? We see a lot of that too as well. So there's a lot of different, increases your risk of diabetes. So out there, there's some make weight loss myths. Eat what you want, take some weight loss pills, and you'll look like her, okay? When in reality, eat what you want, take some pills, and you're still gonna look like that. There's no magic bullet to weight loss. It does take a little bit of work. It takes some effort. It takes some lifestyle change. Yes, there are some nutritional supplements can help, but just taking pills by themselves and then eat whatever you want to eat, that don't work. It just doesn't work, okay? So most diets fail long term because people have cravings for sugar. Now, have you ever noticed in, you crave what you're addicted to. Remember this old commercial, bet you can't eat just one? Well, maybe not one chip, but maybe one bag, because all these processed foods, if you read the label in some form or another, there is some type of sugar in there. Why do they put it in there? Because it's addictive. Sugar is very addictive. And the food manufacturers, the processed food ones, know that, and they get you hooked on their processed foods. So that can, you know this, that contributes to weight gain, eating chips and all those kind of things. We actually have some healthy chips that we use at our office. They're called, um, what are they called, chicken chips? Yeah. Chicken chips, okay, and they're made out of chicken. And so they're much healthier than, and you're getting more, you're getting protein and a very, very tiny bit of carbohydrates in them. But these kind of things have lots of sugar in them. So how many people you know are addicted to broccoli? Not many, right? You don't crave broccoli, but people crave, you do, you crave broccoli? Well, good for you, that's good. So really what happens with this, there's a vicious carb cycle. You eat a lot of carbs, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin kicks in if you're not diabetic, and then your blood sugar crashes, you get hungry again, and it repeats over and over and over and over again. That's where the vicious carb cycle comes in. So basically, just like that. Also, sugar, including fructose. Now, a lot of people are shocked when I say this, but you can overeat fruit too, and it can have the same detrimental effect on your thyroid gland, on your leaky gut, on your weight. That's not to say you can't eat any fruit, but you know, when the summertime comes and there's all those fruits, peaches and nectarines and grapes and all that stuff out there, it tastes good, but people eat too much of it. And that contributes to the same type of thing. Um, it also causes your bad LDL to go up. It oxidizes LDL. Your doctor wants to blame that on fat, but it's not fat. It's sugar and too much fructose that causes it, not that. Um, it also affects your waistline, your teeth. Um, it magnifies the effect of salt on your blood pressure. If you're supposed to be on a low salt diet, eating too much sugar and fructose can make that worse. It makes you want to crave more sugar. Um, and increases, sugar decreases the amount of fat that you burn. Your body switches from fat burning to sugar metabolism, and that creates more problems for you as well. So look at all the sugar in a can of Coke. Uh, and as the size gets bigger, it goes up, so you start looking like Santa Claus, a lot of people. Now what about artificial sweeteners? Well, those were sold to the public as the answer for diabetics and for weight loss. They're actually worse for you. I'd rather, if you're gonna drink Coke, not that I think you should, but I'd rather you drink the real Coke than the Diet Coke because the artificial sweeteners are neurotoxins. They do damage to your brain. They actually cause you to gain weight because they stimulate the appetite center in your, in your brain and it, it decreases leptin, which tells your brain, your brain produces leptin, which tells your body you're satisfied, you don't need to eat anymore, so it reduces that. Um, and it actually raises your insulin resistance problem. So these artificial sweeteners are really worse for you than drinking the real, real stuff, but they don't tell you that and people still drink it. Okay, so again, sugars do this by contributing to addictive eating habits. That's really what happens with it. And then that all raises your insulin. So when your insulin goes up and keeps going up, you develop what's known as insulin resistance, meaning it takes more insulin for your cells to take in the sugar. And then eventually when you become diabetic, uh, it doesn't work so well. Now you're on medications that actually kill your kidneys and your liver. The diabetes medications do that. But elevation in insulin causes all these things, including cancer. Um, how many of you know what your insulin number is? My patients know, but how many of you know what, not your glucose, not your A1C, your insulin number? That's perhaps one of the most important tests that your doctor should run on you. 
why don't they run that test? You know what yours is, because we ran it. Um, Medicare doesn't want to pay for it. It's very inexpensive. It tells us about what your insulin resistance is. The ideal number for your insulin should be low. It should be five or less. The lab range is between two and 19, but I have patients who are, when they come to see me for the first time, they're on diabetes medication and their insulin is 20, 30, 50. I've seen them as high as 80. That tells me your diabetes, even though you're on medication, is out of control. That's what causes weight gain as well. Insulin resistance, that's why people who are using insulin, they often gain weight because insulin causes you to gain weight. And the more insulin resistance you have, the more weight you're gonna gain as well, including all these other things. So what's the daily requirement of carbohydrate intake for the body? That's right, it's zero. You don't have to eat carbs. Now, most people do eat some carbs, you know, vegetables, salad, fruit, stuff like that. But ideally, your body can take protein and fat and make all the glucose that you actually need, and you're healthier that way. So, the number of carbs per day, if you want to be kind of safe, 70 to 800 grams, which is not all that much, but most people eat 300 or more grams of carbohydrates a day, way too much. So, one of the programs we have in our office Part of what we do is we figure out if your weight gain is a thyroid problem, if there's some metabolic imbalances going on. But we also do have a program called Chirothin, which is a specific weight loss program. We have people lose anywhere between 20 to 25 pounds in six weeks because we're changing the way they eat. It's a lifestyle change. Uh, we're changing their metabolism. So it's a doctor supervised program. Um, you eat your own food in the Chirothin program that we have. Uh, but there is some drops. There's no hormones in the drops. There's no medication in the drops. It's all natural. It's some amino acids and some vitamins B12 that help with your detoxification and naturally suppress appetite with it. And we can, we're not gonna go into great detail about that tonight, but it's a program that's been around for a number of years and we routinely see people lose anywhere between 20, 25, 30 pounds over the course of the program. And they're not hungry when they're on the program as well. And the big part about it is that a lot of weight loss programs fail to address what's known as the set point. And the set point is where, you, I won't say happy, but it's where your body is content. If you've been at the same weight for the last three months or more, your body has a certain set point. This is the weight your body's content at. And then you go on a diet, and then you lose the weight, and then you go off the diet, and what happens? You gain the weight back again, maybe even a little bit more than you had before, because they don't address the set point. In the Chirothin program we have, we actually address the set point. So the set point now is now your low, new lower weight. So even though you are on the strict diet part after six weeks, you're on a maintenance type of thing, you're still eating more food, your set point is now at the lower point, and now you're not gaining weight again. And we consistently have people when they finish the program, they're on maintenance, it's a lifestyle change, it's behavioral changes. They maintain their new weight within a pound or so of where they've been at as long as they follow the rules. Now, if you're gonna do that, and then you're gonna go out and eat an ice cream, cake, cookies, candy, and all that junk again, well, yeah, you're gonna gain weight again, because now you're throwing a, a, something else into the mix. So, one of the things we do is we, we check all these different things on our, our uh, body composition analysis. It tells us your fat percentage, your muscle mass, your body water percentage, your metabolic age, which means that you may be 70, but if your metabolic age is 80 or 85, it means your body is breaking down and aging faster than the average person is. And we do measurements, your neck, your shoulders, your biceps, your chest, your hips. So every time when they come in at once a week, we do the body composition analysis, we take all the measurements, and we chart and see how things go along. So that's that program. And it's a program that's safe if you have diabetes, thyroid problems, high blood pressure. The only people who can't do the program is someone who has active cancer currently, if you've got an active gallbladder problem, if you're pregnant or you're nursing. Nobody here is probably fit into those last two, right? So those are the only people who really shouldn't do the program. So now we talked before about thyroid and adrenals. So what are your adrenal glands? Your adrenal glands are two gla walnut-sized glands that sit right on top of your kidney. And they produce a number of different hormones, including cortisol. Well, cortisol can be a problem for weight as well, if your cortisol balance is off as well. So they're your stress glands. And they produce cortisol in 
response to any type of stress that your body may have. Most people, when they think of stress, they think of the emotional stuff. But it can also be changes in the weather. It can be, um, yeah, it can be the emotional things, but it can be toxins, foods, poisons, heavy metals, things like that, all those other stressors. So your adrenal glands get tired over time. And if you don't fix your adrenal gland problem, you're never going to fix your thyroid problem. You're never going to fix your weight problem. So those things are all intimately connected together because a lot of times your thyroid related symptoms are actually an adrenal gland problem that your body is going through. And that's why it frustrates me a lot of times when I ask patients, well, has your doctor talked about your adrenals? And the answer 99.9% .9 of the time is, no, we never talked about my adrenal glands. It's just always been thyroid, thyroid, thyroid. If you don't fix the adrenals with your thyroid, you're not gonna fix either one of the, the problems and you're not gonna fix the weight. So why are the adrenals so important? Many people on thyroid re hormone replacement aren't getting better because their doctor is not fixing their adrenal issue. So cortisol and thyroid hormone are basically like, they're both needed to start our, our, our metabolic engines. It's almost like you have two keys to start. We well, now in your car, it's only one key, but metabolically speaking, you need to have two keys turned to start the engine, the metabolic engine to lose weight, which includes thyroid hormone and cortisol or adrenal hormones. And if both of those are not working properly, you're not gonna have success in what you're trying to do. And when your thyroid, when your adrenal glands have problems, and pretty much anybody over 40, we find they have adrenal problems because we've had years of stress on our bodies that isn't being handled properly. It slows down your thyroid production. So it's like putting a metabolic break on your body. And again, that's why you can't lose weight. That's why you're having those issues uh, and you're fatigued and depressed and tired because both things are not working like they're supposed to. And believe it or not, like insulin resistance, you can also develop thyroid hormone resistance. So you're forcing your thyroid to produce more and more thyroid hormone and your cells become resistant to the thyroid hormone and your cells also can become resistant to adrenal hormone, the cortisol as well, if you keep stressing them over time. So like, like that, adrenal resistance, thyroid resistance. So most people these days living just turn on the TV, right? Turn on the internet, read the newspaper, you know that old story, you're walking through the jungle and the tiger jumps out at you and you run away screaming, and if you live, everything goes back to normal. But the tiger's coming at us all the time now. We, we don't seem to get a break unless you kind of isolate yourself and don't turn on the TV or the get on, read the news or whatever. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. So one way we can test for adrenal function in our office is called an adrenal stress index test. It's a saliva test you do in the privacy of your home, and it basically checks your cortisol levels, it checks your DHEA levels, which is another adrenal hormone. And ideally you want your cortisol level to be highest in the morning when you first wake up. Not that you want to be stressed, but it wakes your body up, wakes your organs up. And as the day goes on, your, th your cortisol should go down, 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 it should be low at night. Very often we have patients who say, I can't sleep at night, and then I'm exhausted in the morning because their cortisol is sky high at night and it's low in the morning, exactly opposite of where it should be. So there's ways to test to see if your adrenals are functioning properly, which also can affect your thyroid and affect the weight issues as well. So having food intolerance problems, things you may be sensitive to, certain foods you eat can also have a negative impact on your leaky gut, on your thyroid, and on your adrenals. So there's ways to test for that as well that we can check with patients. So did everybody fill out their quiz? Everybody, we handed you all a quiz. So we just kind of go over this real quickly. So basically on your quiz, if you added up your points, if you score between one and five points, relatively good adrenal thyroid balance, maybe have a minor role in some of the issues you're having. If you scored between six to 25 points, there definitely is a suspicion that you're suffering from thyroid adrenal imbalances. And that is really a, one reason why you're having the health problems, whether it's your fatigue or your depression, or you can't lose weight. If you score between 26 to 49 problems or points, your thyroid adrenal imbalances are playing a major role in your health problems. And if you score more than 50 points, you're probably dealing with insulin resistance, thyroid resistance, and adrenal cortisol resistance as well. And those are much more serious issues 
to deal with. Okay, so that's how we do the points. The other issue is that your thyroid can affect, and this is where it comes in for women, while we find most of the hypothyroid are actually women. Now, there are some men who develop thyroid problems as well, but most of the majority is women, and it has to do with hormones. And the reason that happens is because stress affects the health of your healthy hormones, or what we call your health and happiness hormones. And what I mean by that is that if you have increased stress, that increases cortisol production. Now, a lot of women, when they become postmenopausal, they have what we call a relative estrogen dominance. In other words, the adrenal glands are responsible for producing sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and cortisol, and all those. But if you're stressed, you're not producing as much progesterone, which is a fat burner. It's a mood hormone. It, it's a feel-good hormone for women in particular. Then what happens is that you have now a dominance of estrogen, and estrogen causes fat storage, fluid retention. It makes you anxious and depressed. Um, and that's all because it relates back to stress issues. And the result of that is that you have stubborn weight gain or you can't lose weight, weight loss resistance, um, menopausal symptoms. I see a lot of women in their late 60s and 70s who still have hot flashes. When you're done with your periods, you should not be having hot flashes. That tell us that you've got some hormone imbalances. Again, it could be adrenal, could be thyroid, could be things related to the leaky gut as well. So stress can affect cortisol, which affects progesterone, which can affect a whole bunch of other things, including the weight issues. And again, men have it too, lesser to, than women, but a lot of men, when they have thyroid problems, will have high cholesterol, they have ED, they'll have infertility problems, they'll have lack of motivation. Um, you know, they used to like to go play golf three or four times a week. Now they don't even watch it on TV because they're too tired and too not motivated to do anything. So again, it affects men a little differently, but it can cause memory problems, brain fog, stuff like that as well. So basically all these problems, like I said before, we, we can do a, an evaluation. Hey, you can come in and talk to us for a few minutes and just see if we're the right fit for you, if you're looking, if we're what you're looking for. Um, the program we do, usually when patients come in and we do an evaluation on them, we bring them back for a report visit. We have a written report for you. It's about 15, 20 pages long. We go over all your test results. <clears throat> if there's things that we think we can do to help you, we'll make recommendations. You get to ask all the questions you need to, and then you decide if you like what I have to say and want to follow my recommendations. It's not a high stress environment. We don't twist your arm or give you a big sales pitch. It's basically, this is what I found. This is how I would recommend we treat your problems. You decide if it makes sense for you or not. We talk about some people need to have clean up their gut a little bit. We use sometimes we use a detoxification program, which is very gentle and helps clean up the liver, the gallbladder, the intestines, and helps to heal the leaky gut. We tell you what foods you're allowed to eat, what foods you should avoid based on your own body's metabolism and physiology, what we find from our evaluations. Yes, sometimes we use vitamins, herbs, um, homeopathic nutrition, because that can help you along the way, as well as the lifestyle changes and the diet. You know, like I said before, you can't eat all the junk you want, take a few pills, and everything's going to work out great. It just doesn't work that way. But we, we help people through it. It's a process for people. When I tell somebody they need to go gluten-free, I don't expect them to be perfect tomorrow morning. It's a process. It takes time to make some changes. It take, it's a lifestyle change. And if you have a spouse that's resistant to changing, it may make it a little harder for you too, but you know, we kind of bring them along with it as well. And you know what? A lot of times when we put women on the lifestyle change, they lose weight and their husband gets on board, the husband loses more weight than the women do. <laughs> they get, the women get a little mad about that, but that's just, again, hormones and maybe some genetic issues, but it works for everybody. So in the end, really, you have to decide if you want to keep eating those foods and drinking those drinks that irritate your gut, cause leaky, leaky gut, and affect your thyroid and adrenals. Is that more important than reversing your thyroid, adrenal, insulin resistance problems? You have to think about how committed you are to getting rid of your health problems. How committed are you to really losing the weight or feeling better or have more energy? And if you don't make changes, what's your life going to be like in a year, five years, ten years from now? Is it going to be... Are di we're different because we try to get your body balanced. We, try to, we don't take people off their medication. That's for the doctor who prescribed the medication to do. But very often we'll work hand in hand with patients and their doctors 
Um, I've had patients who we've got them off their diabetes medication completely. We totally reversed their diabetes, meaning they don't need the medication anymore. All their diabetic numbers are normal. Um, and they didn't need the medication because now they've changed their diet, they are on some right nutritional support, and they're saving their kidneys and the liver, which those medications actually kill off over time. So it's important individual for each patient. And we ask people, does your future look like this or like that? And those are choices that you have to make. I tell patients all the time, I can tell you all kinds of great, wonderful things to do, but you're the one every day that has to decide Am I going to listen to Dr. John? Am I going to eat what I want to eat? Or am I going to listen to what he tells me to do and see the results if we do it? And I really like this quote here. If you, if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. And the last quote is this one from Dr. Greenberg. Maybe some of you have seen this before. As a retired physician, I can honestly say that unless you were in a serious accident, the best chance of living to a ripe old age is to avoid doctors and hospitals. Learn nutrition, herbal medicine, and other forms of natural medicine, unless you're fortunate enough to have a naturopathic physician available. I think I'm one of the only ones around here that does that. Almost all drugs are toxic and designed only to treat symptoms and not cure anyone. Okay, there's all my contact information. There's my website. Uh, I guess, Carl, you're going to have this. This is recorded, right? So somebody can look at it again. Um, there's our phone number and my email address if you have any questions. All right. Questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. As far as I'm concerned, this diet is not working. It's definitely with miracles in my life. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. But you cooperated, too, and didn't and do what you're supposed to do. Most. Most of the time. <laughs> There's always that little catch there, right? Yes? You said that the cortisol kicks in in the morning hours to give us that kick. Right, to get, basically you wake up and get your body going. Okay, so with the cortisol, that also can increase the blood sugars and adrenaline. dawn effect. That's right. But then if the sugars are stable the rest of the day. That's right. How do you. So, uh, well, a lot, a lot of patients, especially diabetic patients, get concerned because they check their blood sugar first thing in the morning, and a lot of times it's elevated. Well, when your cortisol goes up, your insulin goes down, so your blood sugar is going to go up. I tell all my diabetic patients, I don't care what your fasting blood sugar is in the morning. I'd rather know what is it uh, right before you eat a meal and two or three hours afterwards. That's more important to me because I want to see is, is your body metabolically working better to get your blood sugar back down after a meal two or three hours later than first thing in the morning. Um, first thing in the morning, blood sugar, it doesn't matter that much. It really doesn't because it's mostly high in pretty so much then everybody. would you really consider the A1C as your marker if you were to classify somebody? Well, the thing you have to understand about that too is that glucose is, remember the old Polaroid cameras, you take a snapshot picture and it develops in a couple of minutes? That's what your glucose is. It's a snapshot of that moment when they took it. The A1C is more like a videotape average over the last three months of what your blood sugars are running. So it's a marker. But your insulin, I think, is more important because it's a measure of insulin resistance again. And that tells me, are what you, is what you're doing working or not working? If you can get your insulin coming down, yep, things are working. And that's the important thing. So the insulin resistance test would be? That's just a blood test. It's an insulin test. Your doctor doesn't do it. Medicare doesn't want to pay for it. it to me, if I only could do one test on a patient, I would do insulin. If that's the only test I was allowed to do, it would be insulin. Because that tells me a whole bunch of things about inflammation, insulin resistance, how the other organs and glands in the body are working. Other questions? No? Well, either I was really good or just went over everybody's head. I don't know. Actually, I'm sorry. You said on, your, on one of your websites that you don't take insurance We don't. The, we don't because Medicare and insurance don't want to pay for stuff like this. Medicare would rather pay a heart... A, you'd have a $100,000 heart bypass operation and a couple hundred dollars a year so you don't need the darn thing in the first place through right nutrition, lifestyle changes. Our system is backwards. We have a disease illness care system, not a health care system. Okay? So that's a big problem. So I got tired of fighting with Medicare, got tired of fighting with insurance companies, banging my head against the wall, going to bat for years with patients with these companies, and finally we just gave up. You know, we just gave up on it. And yeah, it does come out of your pocket. We try to keep it reasonable for people. Um, but if you want to use your insurance, 
you're going to get insurance type care. And that's the bottom line. But is there a way of coordinating it between, um, you know, coordinating your care between you and one of the other? MDs? Well, I'm willing to work with any of the doctors in the area, but a lot of times they don't want to work with alternative medicine guys. They just don't want to do it. I couldn't even find one. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of patients will say to me, well, okay, I know you, the blood work I do is very comprehensive. And I've worked out a really great deal with LabCorp. That's who we use for our blood testing. It's about $3,500 worth of tests, but that's not what it costs the patient because I pass the savings on to the patient. So my blood test runs around $440 but you're getting $3,500 worth of blood tests. It doesn't, the, doc, the ones your doctor is doing doesn't compare to that. So a lot of patients will say, well, I'll talk to my doctor and they'll run the test for me. It never happens. They won't run the test, mainly because they have to justify to Medicare or the Medicare Advantage why they're doing the test. And if they can't justify to that, to them, the reason, then what happens, and the doctors are scared of this, Medicare can come into their practice and start evaluating all their procedures and all their testing, and then they may get a bill from Medicare. We shouldn't have paid you for all these tests. You owe us $500,000. We'll take a check tomorrow. Yeah, because when I wanted to have my husband's ACOE4 tested, they said, oh, go to 23 and me. Yeah. This was his doctor. Right. Actually, somebody on the team didn't need to do any kind of big tests. So when his, his doctor retired, uh -oh. and I called with somebody on the team, so I don't know. Just yeah, we, we do a genetic test in our office um, for yeah. that check that, the APOE for. Uh, it's like $200, um, where it used to be thousands of dollars yeah. to do those tests. And that's all it is for 23 and me. Well, we don't when use them anymore them. because they sell your information to I the know, government. So we don't use them. We use a separate company. Is there a um, In some ways, it, it's a little different than the Boston Medical Panel. Um, some of the things are the same. Some things they do a little differently than, than we do, but it's very comprehensive. Um, we also have an email list. You know, it, we, can, we only use it to notify you when we're doing our talks around the area. So if you want it, you can see Rhoda at the back. Um, you can put your name on the email list. We don't spam you. We don't sell your email to anybody else. It's just to let you know when we do our talks. It's also on our website. Um, and if you want to do the pre-patient interview, you can talk to Rhoda about that as well. So, you know, it's unfortunate, but we just got tired of fighting, and that's why we just, you know. So are you more in line with something like uh, Dr. Lady Davis or um, Dr. Perlmutter? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, Gluten-free, da gluten dairy-free. Dairy -free. I think people should eat healthy fat in their diet. 25% of your brain is made of cholesterol. 50% of your brain is made of fat, saturated fat. So when a doctor tells you to get on a statin and lower your cholesterol, what are they doing to your brain? They're having a really negative, that's why we see a lot of people come in. People come into my office and they have complaints of memory, focus, concentration problems, and they're scared they're developing dementia. My first question to them is, what statin are you on? because it's usually they're taking Lipitor, Crestor, or one of those, and it's having a negative impact on their memory, focus, concentration, ability to think properly. Well, the other thing with that is when I started on, because I'm on, when I started on the, the, you had to be under 200, whatever, and now they lower that, it's like under 100, so it's like. Yeah, when I, when I was in, numbers, when I, I was in medical school, we, we'd have the, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical reps come in and they talk to us, and one of them came in from Lipitor, and she said the goal eventually is to get everybody's total cholesterol below 100. And we looked at her like, are you trying to kill people? Because you will kill people if that's what happens. Your cholesterol shouldn't be below 150. Then you start to have problems, immunologically, total? neurologically. Is that total? Total. I don't, I don't like to know. see, I don't like to see total cholesterol below 150 in anybody. And if you're over 50, I like to see your cholesterol between 180 and 240 because it means your brain's going to function properly. Now, a lot of doctors will just say, well, cholesterol should be below 200. When I started practice almost 40 years ago, it was 300 was the norm. Now it's 200. Now they're lowering it again. 
The other thing they say is that, well, your LDL is too high, but the blood test they do, it's not even, they're not even measuring your LDL, they're, it, they're doing a calculation. And there's different types of LDL, and actually most of them are good for you. And LDL is not cholesterol. It's actually a protein carrier that moves cholesterol around the body. So if your cholesterol goes up, your LDL is going to go up, but your cholesterol goes up if you have any kind of injury, infection, inflammation, stress, trauma, something happened to your body, your liver is going to produce more cholesterol, and the LDL is like a taxi cab. It moves the cholesterol to the area that needs to be fixed. And then HDL is also a taxi cab. It's not cholesterol. It carries cholesterol from the area that's been fixed back to the liver to either be recirculated or eliminated. That's what it does. But it's easy for the doctor to say, your cholesterol is elevated, your LDL is elevated, your HDL is too low, take Lipitor. But Lipitor and those statins have no effect on LDL at all. It doesn't affect LDL. The way you affect LDL is by changing your diet, get off of the sugar, the junk food, and all that kind of stuff. So, That's a more important marker than cholesterol and LDL and HDL. You have to look at all those things. If your triglycerides are too high, it means that you're eating too much candy, too much junk food, too much sugar, too much alcohol, too much fruit, too much fruit juice. It's all the junk carbs that raises your triglycerides. You actually can lower your triglycerides by eating healthy fat in your diet. So what do you consider healthy fat? I hate the taste of fat. I take off every drop off of meat. Okay, well, if you don't like the taste of it, that's one thing. But, um, you know, organ meats are actually healthy for you. Not, a, not everybody likes to eat them. Liver. Liver is one of them. You know, but I remember growing up, my mom used to cook it till it was like shoe leather. So, but it, actually, you can get liver in capsules now in, in other organs that we have. Liver um, what? Liver, you can get it in capsules. So you're getting all the benefit out of it. Um, but you know, eating, eating healthy fish, for example, salmon, haddock, sardines, herring, not everybody likes to eat fish. Uh, but even eating uh, or a pasture-raised, grass-fed beef, um, things like that are, are fine. Uh, and then the, on the vegetable side, avocados, uh, using avocado oil, coconut oil, uh, olive oil. The oils you want to stay away from are the vegetable oils, like safflower oil, corn oil, canola oil. Nobody should use that ever. That's a poison. Um, peanut oil, just regular vegetable oil. Those are all the bad oils that make more oxidized LDL in your body as well. So healthy fats are good for you, um, and they're important for a lot of different functions in the body. Your brain is healthier and happier when you're eating healthy fat than if you're relying on sugar metabolism. How often do you have some appointments? How often? Yeah, you can um, you can call the office, or you can. T I don't. You're not taking appointments tonight, right, Rhoda? You don't have a way to do that. But if you called our office, we can set up an appointment. We usually we usually have a few of those um, complimentary uh, pre-patient interview appointments set up each week. So um, you know, we, we limit it, but we do have a few each week that we'll do on for patients, and we can usually accommodate people's schedule. You know, either morning or afternoon or something like that. Yeah, if you want to, if you really want to have a pre-patient interview, a complimentary one, at the bottom of that quiz, you can fill out your name and, and phone number, and we'll give you a call, and we'll arrange a time that's convenient for you as well as us. Okay? There's no obligation to do anything. Just now, if you became a patient, how often do you usually have to go in and have to Okay. Well, that's more important. Yeah, that, that really depends on your particular situation. But... Ideally, what we do, at least in the beginning, depending on what your problem is, you know, a lot of times functional medicine or nutrition doctors will just give you a whole pile of stuff to take. Take all these, and I'll see you in three to six months. All right? To me, that doesn't make sense, because if I'm giving you things to take, I want to know, is it working, or do we need to make corrections along the way? So in the beginning, I may see somebody every three or four weeks. That way, we can kind of tweak things a little bit, and as you get better, improve, we either reduce or get rid of stuff you don't need to be taking anymore. But the reason I do it that way is I want to know what's happening with you on a timely basis. I don't want to wait six months to see that, oh, that's not working, now let's correct it this way. If we do it, at least in the beginning that way, we can make changes at the time and course correct as we go along. So that's usually what we do. The initial exam we do is about two hours, 
I do a very detailed and thorough history, physical exam. We do something called Nutrispec testing, where we check your body for any one of six major metabolic imbalances. For example, is your body a fat burner or a sugar burner? We do testing in the office. We do something called nutrition response testing, where we check all the major organ systems of the body for nutritional balance. We do send patients to get blood work. Um, if people have some current blood work, meaning it's not more than a month old, very often it's missing a lot of the important tests that I would do, so we have to kind of fill in the blanks with other blood tests. And if there's any other functional medicine test that we would recommend based on your exam and based on what we find, um, patients pay what I pay for any lab work. So if it costs me $100 to do the test, that's what it costs you. I don't like money doing the testing on the patients. But we just don't test everything because we can. I know some functional medicine doctors will just throw it all against the wall. Let's see what sticks, and you end up with a bill for $5,000. No one's come out of our office owing $5,000 in testing, ever. Um, if there's an indication for the test, we'll talk about why I want to do it, what I'm looking for, and again, you pay what I pay for the test. But we don't do all these tests on everybody because it's not necessary, only if there's indications for it. And then after we do all our testing, like I said, we bring you in for a report visit. We go over all your results. We give you copies of everything, make recommendations, and you decide if you like what I have to say or not. There's no pressure. So that's kind of what we do. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for being here.